Hi everybody. Uh, we have Mark. He's going to finish off the day, finish off our show with his explanation of uh, many things, many, many things. Yeah. <laughs> and he could summarize it better than I can. Go ahead, Mark. Well, back in the day, you know, your uh, graphics arsenal, depending upon what kind of work you did, consisted of at least deluxe paint, maybe um, some kind of video program, although a lot of stuff was done in animation format. You have um, Scala, of course, for presentation. Uh, Lightwave. What else was on that list? Scala, Lightwave, DC, DC TV. And DC TV is a cool add-on product. So I'm trying to show how they all fit together. Um, with D Paint, here, in our screen mode. D Paint was one of those programs where you could use it at the surface level and you can just try to draw. But for me, drawing with the mouse is kind of hard. Um, I know there are pixel artists that, you know, they go in and zoom in and draw one, you know, pixel at a time. And that's how they build stuff. And that, that's really, you know, the, the, the masters of the, uh, of the thing. But for, for doing, like, uh, graphic design, titling, logos or animation, you know, you, you can do a lot of neat stuff with the toolbar, but the real, like, next level is the keyboard shortcuts. Like, um, you know, the period is the switch back to the one pixel draw. Uh, B is capture a brush. So what I'll do is, uh, I'm gonna load a brush, which is like a thing you can draw on the screen. Brush. So I got our logo here. Mm. Uh, now it loaded it in with the palette that I have already set up here, so I'll, I'll load the picture as a background to get the palette out of it. There we go. Oh. Now I can clear that out. Um, and then one other thing I'm going to do for the size, I'm going to, oh, I can't stretch it. There we go. Hopefully this won't go too bad. There we go. And then while you have a brush, you can use X to flip on the X axis. Oh. Y, the flip on the Y, there's H and D for half and double, so hit H, H, although if you go back again, it's going to look hard. So then the period takes me back to that one pixel, and let's load that brush up again. Uh, let's drop it down here and add a little style to this. And this is the 90s, right? So uh, everything's got to be like uh, either drop shadows or chrome color. <laughs> so I've got some grayscales in my palette. So what I'll do is I'm going to go and create a stencil. And a stencil is like, an, like almost like a literal stencil where you make something that has a cutout and you can spray paint over it and then when you take away the cutout, only the things that were at holes are there. So they, they do it based on color. So I think, yeah, there we go. And then I want to invert. So I'm stenciling everything but the lettering color. Hmm. And I make. All right, and then uh, I'm going to go to the yeah, bar, color range, and I'm going to make a little chrome thing. So I'm going to go from the white to the gray, and then pick up white right after that, and then go back down to gray again. Let's see, let's look at that. So it's there. And there, DK5 is a better rendering thing. It's like a random dither, so it's going to look kind of like someone spilled like pepper and salt on the table. The uh, DK5 had a better gradient thing. It had a more natural look than gradient, but this is fine. Hmm. Um, okay. And now I want to draw the gradient on here. Now I don't want to draw it like freehand. I just want to like plaster it on there. So you got the rectangle. The rectangle, half of it is uh, just the outline, and the other half is drawing a solid. So I click down here to do the solid rectangle, and I'm going to right click. And normally, I just do solid. It's going to just draw whatever color I have selected. But down here, you can say, all right, I want to draw this range here. I'm going to do uh, vertical. You can also do other, other things, like uh, lines, any direction. Shape will conform to the, it'll warp the gradient to the shape of the object you're filling. Circle, and I forget contour, and high, I'm not sure how this works. Uh, if I just do a vertical gradient, okay. 
and then I'm going to draw a rectangle that's big enough to cover my logo. But notice it's, only, it's not going to get the uh, color bars there. We should just do the top of that. Let's try that. Oh, hold on. I'm not pretty sure, right? Let me get back into my stencil. There it is. It's good. Mm -hmm. So that's the color. But then I want to invert, I think. Okay, now it's working. Mm. So let's draw that again. <laughs> and then let's uh, turn off the stencil. Oh, the, the little tilde key here has a purpose for the stencil. Turn it off and on. Now when I pick up a brush, I hit B for brush, okay? Um, if I just click and drag, it picks up the brush and it leaves it on the page. If I hit B again and I right click, it picks up the brush and it erases everything with whatever is your background color. So you've got two colors here. There's the, the um, foreground color is the, is the square, and then the area around it is the background color. So I right click to make that. So if your background color is black, and the background around your brush is black, what you pick up has transparency. Mm. So that way you can grab something that's just a logo or not a rectangular shape. Now I can do something like this. Let's see, I can do uh, shift B. Alright, so I want to give this a little more of a highlight shadow thing. I mean, one simple way to do that is to just draw it in a single color. So I'm going to go to white and then go up to brush and there's a mode. Oh, mode. The mode button. So the modes you have like, just draw it. Then you can just make it a color. So I'm going to hit F2. And so whatever color I pick here, it just draws it in that color. So I can draw white. And then I'll pick like a dark grayish color. And then position this as carefully as I can. Oh. Yeah. There's a way to nudge this one pixel at a time, but the tricky part is you have to take your hand off the mouse, and the minute you do that, it moves. Because your mouse doesn't save it. Now I've got my shadow and highlight. I want to draw back with the regular matte mode. And maybe I'll place it. Let's do this. It's like uh there we go, look at that. I kind of messed up my text at the bottom because there's not much going on. There's not enough going on here. Let's do this. Say goodbye to the uh, subtitle. Look at that, Chrome class. <laughs> um, and then we can animate. So let's do this. Oops, I'm doing Brush, pick it up. And the animation part, um, there's a couple ways of doing it. There's a, under M, there's this, uh, where is it, uh, thing called move. And it's basically, I want to move from here to there, an enemy. And you got to do it over so many frames. But what I always used to forget, and I'm not, not going to do this time, is you got to tell it number of frames first. <laughs> if you animate it on one frame, it's basically going to draw the same animation on the same, on top of itself over and over again. So I'm going to go to frames and say, I want like 20 frames. That's not a lot, but that, that, won't, that way it won't take too long. Right. And now if you see up here, it says one of 20. And I think, um, there you go. The one and two key uh, let you go through all the frames. So yeah, right now I'm at frame, they're all the same, so you don't really see much happening. So let's take our brush, and I'm going to click it here, which I want to go to frame 20. I'm going to click here in the middle, actually that's not the middle, that's the middle, and that's the menu bar. And now I'm going to go to move, and we want to move to this position from this. So let's say we'll make it uh, like negative 500 in the Z, and then rotate, I don't know, 88 degrees this way, and uh, 120 that way, kind of flip and play around. I don't think I need it to be cyclic. Let's see, let's preview that. There you go. Well, you know what, the Y, maybe I'll leave that off. That's making it really tall and narrow. Let's see, can you hear? There we go, nice and simple. If you can even see that. So let's say. Uh, <laughs> 
Let's hit draw. So now it's filling in each frame right. in memory oh. with the position for that, yeah. memory it as it goes. And when it's done, oh, very, animation. very <laughs> nice, very, very nice. And, you know, you can go in one frame at a time. And if you do like cartoon style animation, you can use these keys and like, draw something. And then I think maybe Deluxe Paint 4 doesn't have this. I think 5 had it, yeah, where they call it um, onion skin. So you can make it look, you can see the frame before to kind of get an idea of what your positioning was if you're drawing like a whole person walking or a ball bouncing or something like that. So that's Deluxe Paint. Um, let's go quit out of there. There's a lot more, you can, you can spend a whole day on Deluxe Paint. There's people that make, make like uh, hours and hours of tutorials on Deluxe Paint. Uh, the other thing I have hooked up here while I'm connected here is uh, DCTV. So DCTV is a box. It kind of uses probably a similar the original Spark uh, that the video backup system. It's like maybe we could put data in the video signal. You know, I think the toaster does that as well. And the idea is you can use a four plane, which means 16 color image, but encoded in that image, almost like a QR code in video, is a 24 bit color picture. Hmm. But they sacrifice some resolution. It's probably using several pixels to describe one pixel. Because you need, you need a lot of bits to say how many, which color of that 24-bit palette you're, you're getting, right? But because it's a large palette and it's also coming out of a composite video output, it kind of blurs it all together so it looks, okay. It looks okay. <laughs> it kind of squint and looks fine. So, you know, on an Amiga that, you know, at best, this had Ham 8, which is not bad. You get pictures like this. So let's go to the frog. And it loaded really quick because as far as the Amiga is concerned, that's a 16 color picture. But the DCTV is decoding the information. Can I, can I get up real quick and just go quick here? So this is what the image really looks like. Oh, interesting. So that's the frog. And that image is being decoded by the DCTV into oh. a 24 bit picture. Mm. Um, I also have hooked up over here a SuperGen, which is for overlaying graphics over video. Um, uh -huh. And normally the, the DCTV and SuperGen, without this special box, really are two independent systems. Um, DCTV takes your output out of your computer, and you're normally supposed to plug into a little composite out there and have another monitor, basically. Mm. So in, in the olden days, <laughs> you had your 1084 over here with your weird pixelated grayscale, and then you had your other TV monitor with DCTV on it, and that's okay. kind of look back and forth. But this thing came out um, maybe a year later after the DCTV, and it basically converts the DCTV output so that the SuperGen can stick it in, you know, decode it and display it out as video on the SuperGen. Hmm. And now you get it all on one model. Yeah. It's pretty nice. Um, the SuperGen, let's see, is my camera on? Yes. Camera's on. The SuperGen has little sliders here. So there's our live video feed. And you can also key it. I don't know what it's going to do if I key it. Oh, it's okay. You can sort of see. There's like a little bit of thing in there. Um, but let's, go, let's do this. I'm going to put on a DCTV and go to like my desktop. Pull down that slider. There we go. Oh. So that's SuperGen taking video from the camera in and over keying over that, the uh, desktop, anything that's not a background color. And one of the applications I've done with the SuperGen is with Scala. Where, so I'm going to take one of the pre-made scripts called Scala Video. So if I just run this, it shows you what you can do with titling over live video, and then you would record that and make your video. Mm -hmm. you know, I could do uh, lower thirds, titles, mm -hmm. tickers. Here, let's see, let's go a little bit further here. 
credit scrolls. You can do credits with this thing. And it can do a continuous push of several pages mm. worth of names. Drawing tools, maybe a little ticker. And it's not bad. It's synchronized, it's gen locked to the video signal so it doesn't look choppy. And you can do some graphics, or I'm speeding it up here. Buttons. So this is kind of neat. You can control the scoreboard. <laughs> Subtitles. So what I'm going to do next, though, is um, let's see. I'm going to take another script, Skeleton, and this is all graphics. But you can see some of it has dark backgrounds. Yes. So what I'll do is I'm going to go to. Um, oh wait, I'm going to use it. Uh, oh no, did I, did I, did I, did I, did I forgot something? Oh, it's there. Okay. I'm just going to move it. There's a super gen module. So I'm going to move it up here so I can actually see it when I go back. There it is. So what I'll do is on the first slide, we'll set super gen to Amiga. And then uh, maybe when we get to the You Got It, that's got a background. So let's switch that to. Um, video. Oh, actually, no, you don't. This one, we'll go back to uh, Amiga, hmm. and there we go. So when it's when this you got it comes up, which I'm gonna increase the duration. That's a super. Um, pause. So when we run this now. We have an animation. And then uh -huh. key it, and then it went back to this full graphics. So let's do this. Actually, it was kind of soon. So let's take this and remove it, none. and we'll wait till we get to um, to the eye. We'll do that. And we'll switch back to Amiga on the eye. There. Video. Oh, keying over the video. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. As long as the background color is what you want to key, it's great. And then when it gets to the eye, it'll switch back to full video. And it can do fades. So, you know, we go back to those settings here. Instead of just cutting from one setting to another, there's like a fade time here. So we could make it fade over time. But usually you just want to change modes. And that's uh, you know combining a whole bunch of things together. It's all, almost all the graphics may, usually people make that they put into Skull. They made a deep paint. In fact, one of these demo these uh, scenes here, like this one, the artwork is from deep paint. They hmm. screen grab deep paint and made it fly out at you. <laughs> it's hard to tell. It's all just blocks and stuff. So that's Scala. And then the last part here is quit. And. Lightwave. Yeah, Lightwave. The Lightwave is probably the most fun to work in, but has the highest learning curve. All 3D programs are just tricky to work with. You know, you have to, especially on an old computer. I mean, it's nice seeing it this big. Imagine working on this on a, you know, a 1084, which was like a 14-inch monitor. Interlace mode, everything's flickering, and then you're trying to like create something that's a giant spaceship or a logo. Or something. Mm -hmm. um, the Lightwave has two programs. There's the modeler. And then there's the um, the layout, which I'm in right now. I should have actually. I want to run. Yeah, go to the model real quick. And I'm going to load a graphic, which should look familiar now. Look at that. I think the A key fills the screen. There we go. So. Um, Drew this in Adobe Illustrator, exported it out as EPS, it's like a slightly older vector format, and then the Windows version of Lightwave can load that in and export it back out to the Amiga version of Lightwave, oh, and then copy it over, and here we are. Now this logo, as it is, is very flat; it's paper thin. God, you can see the side view here. It's 
not much going on there. Right. So what I'm going to do real quick is go to multiply, or is it modify, Mul extrude. And if I click here, yeah, there we go. That's the, the distance it's going to extrude it. Huh. That's fine. Hit enter. Oh, really greedy. it made a thickness. Now, the, one thing I want to do before I, well, I'll do this when I bring it into the uh, layout. Uh, I'm going to go to Objects, Save As, and we're going to call this Class 21 3D. And then we'll go back to the layout program. And go to Objects. And there it is. It's now from this view, you control what are you viewing from, whose perspective are you seeing things, and then what are you changing about it. And there's two here. Edit. There's a position in that. So let's say we want to view from the camera, and we want to move the camera too. See, because I'm camera. So we can then zoom, move the camera in, roll in over the side here, move in a little more, and then uh, rotate it. Okay, might have to pull back a little bit. Too much of a close up. A little faster than the CAD program. Ah, you mean uh, CAD, yeah. CAD M has to be even faster? <laughs> now, um, I might have to move the object up, so let's go to objects, move. Uh, and just move it in the Y, so it's not... Oh, well, it might be sitting on the ground. Let's look at it from the left side here. You yeah, know, it needs to move up. So the object... Uh, and there's the object. There we go. So it's like, it'll be above ground. It'll be cut off okay. by the ground. And then we got to fix the camera, too. That's well, not bad. It's kind of a low-angle shot. Now, i got to remember this. I always make this mistake all the time in Lightweight. You gotta create a keyframe. Once you start messing with stuff, if you if I leave the frame I'm on right now, everything will go back to its defaults. So you create a key for the camera, create a key for the object, and then I won't be uh, frustrated later. <laughs> Last thing we one more thing we need, we'll go to the top view and um, let's see, I want to edit the view and zoom out. I need a light. And there's already one there, but it's like sitting right in the middle of the object. Hmm. So we're going to move that, like over here, and then look from the side, move it up. And then the best way to line up the light is to see what the light sees. So I'm going to go to view from the light. Oh, look at that. We're lighting nowhere, the ground. Uh, so we go to rotate, and we try to find our object. Oh, there it is. Yeah. There we go. But I want the lighting to be a little more drastic, so I'm going to move this light more over here, so the shadows will be more pronounced. And then we'll go back to viewing from the light, and rotate. There we go. And then create a keyframe. <laughs> All right, now if I render this, um, we're going to display it in hand mode. I'm going to camera, and we'll set it to like low resolution, because we don't need to see it super high res from here. Um, Something I'm going to notice, and I know that's going to happen, but I'm going to show it to you first. There. So we're in a dark room with a black logo. Yeah. So we need to change something about our environment. Um, fortunately, I can do something really quick here. If I go to Effects, this is called Backdrop. You have fog and sky. Oh. I'm just going to turn on Gradient Backdrop, and there's some nice default colors. It looks like you're on a warm summer day. Uh, okay. And... Um, then I'm going to go to Surfaces, and I have Surfaces already set up. So when I brought this into Lightwave, I went and selected painstakingly all the Surfaces and said, okay, this is the small text, this is the yellow bar, the, all the color bars in the logo. So I can just go in now and not have to do that. I can just say, all right, I want the small text. Pure black is not very exciting because it doesn't have any shading. So I'm going to make this like uh, 100 out of a palette of 255. The gray, and then do the same thing for the large text because they're basically the same. Make it blue. All right. Um, while
while we're here, the large text, let's make it glossy. Um, I think I increase the specular level a little bit. That looks good. You can put on smoothing, but I think that'll slow down things. So the way it is, let's do another render. From there, we can go on. I and mean, the lighting I'm using is the default light, which is called a distant light, which is like a very simple, it doesn't really obey the laws of physics. The light just goes through it. Any surface it hits and keeps going and, and just lights everything. But if you do a, a, a spotlight, it acts more like a proper light where things cast shadows on each other and can make a shadow on the ground, which I don't think I need to change anything for. And it's set to ray trace, which is what we want. Let's run that again. A little better, a little smoother. There should be a shadow, but you know, I think our light is angled at such an angle that it's not getting it unless, uh, let's see. Oh wait, trace shadows. Turn that button on. Oops. This will take a little bit longer this time. But I got the 060, so hopefully not to be too bad. Oh, it's, yeah, it's looking great. Oh. The thing about shadows, it's not just realism, it adds a little more contrast to your oh. screen. So now the letters are casting shadows on each other. Uh -huh. I think to do the shadow on the ground, I might have to add an object to be the ground so that it'll officially receive shadows, unless there's a setting for that. But that, you know, you get the idea. Now look how long it took to render that. That's low res. If we go to what would be, you know, even medium res, that's 752 by 40, it's standard definition video. And then maybe we want to turn on enhanced low anti-aliasing, which keeps it, it smooths out the jagged edges. Right. Um, and then while I'm here, I'm just looking for any of the things I want to change. Let's go to effects. Let's render that. Let's see how long it takes. So it says down here, segment one, so it's only got one group. Like it, if it's too much, if there's not enough memory, which it doesn't have a problem with in this card, but on a lower memory machine, it'll render one strip at a time mm -hmm. and do that one area of the screen, then do the next area and do the next area. Um, it's only got one segment for the whole screen, and it's past one of five. So it, it'll render initially, and then it looks for any areas that have contrast, like at edges. And then past two of five is it renders again and gets more detail on those edges. So that way it starts smoothing them out so they're not jaggy. And then we're at two of five. five. So imagine, you know, this is one frame. You know how long it took us to do 20 frames in deep paint? Imagine doing mm. 20 frames here. And that's 20 frames. <coughs> that's like, that's like a, that's not even a second. In video terms, 30 frames a second. Right. So you know, with the uh, solar sailing stuff that we did, we were rendering hundreds, five thousands of frames, and the hard drives would get full. Uh. So when we were doing the solar sail animation, we would take the tops off all the 2000s, render as much as we could fill up a hard drive, unplug it, put the next one in, fill that one up, and then we take one of those over to the TV editing bay where we just. Uh. Repeat, reverse the process and play them back one at a time and record the whole thing. So integrating pixels, is it done or is it still doing it? It's not the only way. But like on my original like A500 in Sculpt 4D, oh, that's on four out of five, almost done. Um, I remember letting uh, one image take three days to render. Oh. I just had to leave my computer alone three for three days, days. Wow. just to render one, you know, fully ray tracing. When you, once you turn on shadows and ray tracing and reflection, it's got so much math to do. <coughs> the poor little 68,000 is like, okay, I hope you have some time. Because <laughs> we're not going to be ready for a while. Nowadays, you know, a mobile phone can do this in real time. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't it fun? Like one thing I've seen done, and I've done it for a project, is you, know, you can grab video, convert it to individual files, like a directory full of frames that are numbered properly. Um, you can apply that as a texture map on an object in Lightwave, and then when it renders, it swaps in each video image for a frame on your render, so you get video mapped onto objects. So hmm. that was kind of cool. 
if you had the time. Uh, okay, we're almost done here. Yay. So the edges are no longer jaggy. Right. You know, I'll probably get them more with the ground. You get the idea. Yeah. Uh, those are most of the things. Surfaces, lighting, camera. There's even there's things that are in here like uh, I think it's called this might be quick shade. And there were render filters you could apply if you wanted to get make like a 3D cartoon look. So it would look three-dimensional, but it would be look like a cartoon. Why that slide. There you go, that's our uh, whole arsenal of, of tools <laughs> to make stuff in the 90s. So each of these sections that you have told us about would take days of learning. <laughs> <laughs> and you've only done it in a few minutes. There you go. Yeah. Questions, guys. Any questions? Well, and then in the speed of this computer, I mean, right. we didn't have that back then. So imagine how long it would have taken to do back so then. So, uh, is, is is the speed of this dependent on the computer you're having an FPU or no? For lightweight, yeah, it, it, 3D stuff needs the FPU. Ah. Or not? I mean, if you don't have it, you're you're just waiting long, too wait, way too long. Oh, you are. Because you know they they're coming out with new FPGA boards like you know, there's the Vampire 1200. There's the Ice Drake 1200 in the future, which is even faster, but those don't have FPU. No, yeah, that's, a, that's kind of a frustration. I can't run the FP version. No, Lightwave, this is version 5. Um, version 3, which is somewhere down here, um, that didn't need an FPU. It, didn't, it wasn't designed for that yet. Um, so you could still run that version, but I guess. It's kind of like brute force will make it work faster because if the vampire is like if the F FPGA is, is so much faster just in raw horsepower, then it'll just it'll make up for the fact that it's not doing a math process. Huh, interesting. Maybe I don't. So we'll have to try that out. <laughs> questions, anybody? Any questions? Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. The Commodore Los Angeles Super Show.